This is Vigneto, a podcast. From the sun and soil they grow. From the land and sea they roam. Drinking wine in the great unknown. So I'm really happy to be back here on my third episode of this series of the Vigneto podcast when I speak with writers about their books that have to do with the wine industry. And my guest today is Mike Madeo. He is a writer and the author of a book called Lost Pen. And it has a very long um, title. So I'm going to let him say the full title of his book. So welcome, Mike. It's really nice to see you. Tell me about, first, tell me the full title of your book. So it's Lost Mount Pen, Wineries, Railroads, and Resorts of Reading. Um, I think that's just for marketing purposes, you know, you got to cover all the things that are inside to try to right. travel, yeah. railroad, yeah. reading. Got it. Yeah. So tell me about, tell me about this book. You wrote it in 2019. Is that when you finished the book? I did. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a multi-year project, not surprisingly. It's, it's interesting because it's, it's lost Mount Penn. Mount Penn is a mountain that's outside the city of Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, which is, you know, may seem on the surface to be somewhat obscure, right? Um, Reading, PA is not really a major city. It was at one time. The, um, the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad was like one of the largest companies in the world in the 1800s. And so it was, it was more of a metropolis then. Um, but it's, it's a city that's about an hour, a little more than an hour outside of Philadelphia towards the west, Mm-hmm. kind of in between Philly and Harrisburg, which is the capital of Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's a little bit of a weird one. Um, <laughs> I can really admit that. Uh, but I, as someone who lives in the Philly suburbs, I was reading something about, I think I was reading about Pennsylvania Dutch cuisine at the time, which is, you know, still has a, a pretty impactful, uh, on this, on this is still pretty impactful on this area, the cuisine of the PA Dutch, um, obviously like Amish country and things like that are touristy and, and, and such. Um, but I, I started reading about this wine house in Reading in the 1800s, and I thought like, wow, that's like not too far from where I live. That seems really cool. Um, I've, you know, having spent a lot of time, of course, in Italy and, and France and places like that, I'm, I'm fascinated by wine culture. And mm-hmm. how in the United States, especially in the East Coast, we, we don't necessarily have that European wine culture. So, so hearing that it existed in Pennsylvania, relatively close to where I lived, kind of pulled me in. And I started reading more about it. And I found out that there were all these wineries and wine houses on this mountain, Mount Penn. And there's a couple other small mountains in this area. And then they, they started out as wineries and they kind of built up to be these tourist destinations where people would go and on the weekends and eat, you know, good German American food and drink local wine and sometimes imported wine and go on the railroad rides. And, and it just seemed like this really incredible cultural epicenter that, that was here. And unfortunately is completely gone at this point, but that, that was kind of what led me into it just as a wine lover, not necessarily someone who was so tied to that particular place. I mean, obviously I live in the general vicinity, but um, it was really about how the, we sort of had this mostly German driven wine culture um, here and, and then, then it went away. So were they German varietals? Was there a lot of Riesling? Like what were they growing at the time? And what are we talking about? The middle of the 1800s? Yeah. So it started like, I would say, I mean, the Germans started to come here in the 17, in the mid 1700s, mid to late 1700s, you saw the first wave. And then there was another wave in the early 1800s and and then kind of throughout the 1800s. Um, So like everywhere else, and, and I talk about this in the book, actually. So on the East Coast, a bunch of people tried to grow Venefra and mm-hmm. it just wasn't successful. In fact, William Penn was one of the first. He brought over a bunch of cuttings from Bordeaux and he came here in, 
I want to say the late 1600s, might have been early 17s. And so they planted them like by the river in Philly, but they weren't successful. They, they died out within a few years for the most part. And then um, a few decades later, a guy who was gardening for William Penn's son found this grape that he didn't recognize and they eventually determined that it was a hybrid so it was the first hybrid of of one of the bordeaux grapes that Penn brought over and um, some native grape and that was called alexander and so that was really the first like viable grape that could make drinkable wine that wouldn't die out because of climate weather pests whatever the case may be probably for lots of so of course, is that a red variety, Alexander, or is it a white variety? It's a red variety. Um, I mean, does it still grow? Do you know? It does not what? exist that I'm aware of. Um, huh. And you know, so once they once they realized that the hybrid was viable, people started yeah. to create other ones and and were more right. successful with it. But um, in really all over the East Coast and sort of the um, late 1700s, early 1800s, Alexander was like the grape. It was the, um, so that was like the signature variety of the Pennsylvania region in the mid 1800s. Yeah, like and, um, early on in Reading, in particular, they called it the Reading Red, and, and a bunch of German immigrants had um, had were making wine from this Alexander grape, and it, it sort of developed a little bit of a reputation. Now, some people tried, they tried to bring over other vinifera. Um, I found evidence of that in my research, but again, yeah. it typically didn't last very long once they did it. Um, so is there a region in Germany where most of the people came from? I'm just thinking about like, you know, were they Germans from the Rheingau and were they drinking red wines in the Rheingau and then brought over their cultural traditions? Like, did you, did you research that part of it? Like, were they Germans from one area in Germany? So it's mostly from the Palatinate or the Falls um, area. Okay. So south, Southwest Germany. So, um, so obviously very, um, like it's very wine focused. I mean, a lot of people are surprised when we talk about the German immigrants and wine because they think, oh, Germany, it's beer. Um, right. No, but, but Faltz is great red wine. If I remember my studies yeah. from a long time ago, I have this image of like Faltz red wine. Am I wrong? Is that right? I mean, they have, um, they make some interesting uh, Pinot, ne Pinot Noirs um, mm -hmm. these days, um, Spatbergunder. Uh, uh -huh. as well. I mean, obviously Riesling from there is great as well, but you know, these guys, yes. when they came over, they, you had to work with what you had to work with. And, and they, yes. and so they, they, as I said, they did try to bring over Renefra, but it didn't work very well. And, um, and so they started working with Alexander and then the, the kind of second wave um, came through where you had um, Catawba, which is, is still around today. Yes, it is. I actually like that grape. Yeah. I, I mean, they're, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's like what's old is new again. It feels like right. um, there's renewed interest in hybrids now that right. the winemaking is kind of caught up. And because, especially around here, it's difficult to grow. Like Venefra, we figured out how to grow Venefra in the Northeast, but in a sustainable way, it becomes more difficult. So the hybrids right. allow you to be a little more sustainable, um, if organic or biodynamic or whatever you want to do. Um, right, well, that is true. There, a lot of Cabernet Franc grows in Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's it does well in cooler climates. Um, I There's no evidence of this in the long past, but... What I'm excited about in Pennsylvania is Gruner Veltliner. I think it's it's fantastic. There's some really good examples of it, and it seems That's to grow pretty well all over the place. Um, so again, you know, sticking with that Germanic route, or right. if you're in Italy, going with the more like the cooler climate stuff, like you know, the Grine or Terraldigo, or um, are they like growing that stuff in in Pennsylvania? A few people are, and I just read something the other day about San Marco, which is a a, a, a cross between those two. Oh, that's that interesting. I don't know that. Growing in New Jersey, and, and apparently it's doing really well. Really? In New Jersey? San Marco? Yeah. And it's a cross between La Grine and Toraldigo? Yeah. 
Well, okay, I'll have to look that one up. That I didn't know. Um, I digress from your book, though. So <laughs> the book is about wine and German immigrants and railroads. And where did you do your research? How did you get this project going? So you find these documents, you read about it, you start thinking, hey, maybe I'll write a book about this or I'll write an article about it. Is that how it started? And then it like kind of ended up being a book because there was so much that you found? Yeah, so I, I the first... Um, that first day that I found this mention of it, you know, I had one of those moments where it was, you know, it was, I think it was on the weekend, it was light out. And then like, all of a sudden it's dark out and I'm sitting like staring at my computer screen and, you know, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened in 1877. Um, and my wife is thinking I'm completely nuts. Um, but I started to do like, yeah, I started to dig into it a little bit. Um, newspapers.com um, was something that I started using, which is, huge in terms of um it's just like an it's it's owned by ancestry and they just have a lot of old newspaper archives and you can search and allows you to to much more quickly than the old microfilm way of having to, to scroll through all this stuff actually go through and and kind of kind of pull up information and then um there's a uh the burke's history center in reading has a library that um, had a lot of, of really interesting older text and some newer stuff that had, had collected some of the stuff that I was looking at. So I was able to, to go over there. And I, I first pitched this as an article to the, um, the Historical Review, which is the publication of that, that history center. And I forget why it never happened, but I don't know if they just, if it was just like they were filled up or whatever, but they ended up contacting me and saying like, would you present this instead? We do like um, a monthly you know, speaker series where someone will come in and talk about a topic. And so I ended up doing that. Um, and then, you know, every once in a while, I would just continue to kind of dig into it a little bit and learn more about it. And, and that's, you know, eventually I got the idea. So I think there's enough here to, to actually put a book together. So, yeah, well, so that's was, amazing. Yeah. It wasn't that's like an really overnight cool. thing by any, by any stretch. Nothing ever is. So that's really interesting. So my next question, cause this kind of this series is both about the books that people write, but also how they write them. So what was your writing process here? Like, is it very different from your writing process on your blog or when you're writing an article? Like, did you have a certain space that you wrote in and I need X amount of words a day? Like, how did it, how did it work out? Yeah. I mean, obviously it was daunting because I'd never written anything this long before. I think it ended up being about 45,000 words. Um, that is long. Some of that was like, like in the book, there's a fair amount of excerpts from other things like so one of the things that fascinated me about this and, and that actually for me made it go from like a really interesting topic to something that's that's really worth highlighting especially considering this the somewhat obscure region was the way people of the era wrote about this like there was so much um like the prose and they wrote poetry about these these like these wines and these the mountain views and all this kind of stuff and it was um it was really fascinating from that perspective and so some people will say when they're writing books that they need to like block off everything and just like carve out time and, and really just dive into it and that may be true but like i just there's no way i can do that like I'm a dad, um, you know, I have a job, like all this kind of stuff, right? So so I, I actually ended up using something called the Pomodoro method. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with this. No, yeah, but I'd love um, to know what it is. It was I invented by a guy named Antonio Pomodoro. I think okay. I think he was, He. I'm not sure if he was Italian-American or Italian, but it's like essentially he came up with this method for working where you have 25 minutes of like focus and then you take a five or 10 minute break and then you can do another 25 minutes of focus and i just like i said if i can do like if i can average one a day one 25 minute of focus a day i think i'll i'll make progress and so i try that out and some days i would do more other days i wouldn't do any um 
you know, the most you, you could probably do is like three or four in a day and then you're completely spent. But, um, but, but that I could, I could find 25 minutes. I felt like, you know, and so, so again, I mean, sometimes there, you would, you know, you'd be in a thought process and you'd want to keep it going. Um, but, you know, so, and sometimes you'd have the time to do that and other times you'd have to stop. But, um, but that allowed me to just, you know, get through it, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, th this sort of pipe dream of saying, I'm going to take a whole Saturday and just really focus on this. Right. Or I'm going to write a thousand words each and every single day. Yeah. yeah. My pipe dream. And some days, you know, some days it would be writing, other days it would be research, other days it would be, you right. know, and I actually, I mean, I find the research probably a little bit easier, even though it's a lot and you have to go through a lot of stuff, like you don't necessarily have to put your thoughts exactly out, whereas really, you know, getting it written out was a little more challenging, but, um, but so a lot of research up front and then kind of catching up with the writing. Well, that's a great, that's a great, thank you that you gave me a great tip, but do you have any other tips for aspiring writers who have an idea? Anything else that you suggest that people look at or think about or like ways of ways of getting that project out there? So, I mean, one thing for me was like the idea around self-publishing versus publishing with a, a company or, or whatever. And I ended up publishing this with, with the History Press, also um, part of Arcadia Publishing. And they do a lot of local history books, like that's their specialty. Um, okay. so, so it was a good fit for me. Now, I mean, obviously when you're, you're working with a company, you're seeing less you know, of the profit per book, but you're sort of trading that off for having some marketing and having the infrastructure to put it all together. Um, the challenge obviously is, well, not obviously, but the challenge is that a lot of publishers now in the US require an agent to pitch a book somewhere. Um, the History Press does not. So that was that was nice that I could pitch them directly and they, they responded and they were interested. Um, getting an agent is like an, another is a trickier thing. And, and so, so that's, that's a whole process that you have to go through. And I've, I've spent some time looking at that and, and talking to some people about that, but I haven't um, done anything with that specifically. Um, but, but that, that's just the whole thing you have to learn about. And, and it is really a challenge. Now, obviously there's a lot of like ways that you can self publish, um, but it's really about the marketing and the distribution. Like, how do you get it out there? And right. I wasn't super comfortable feeling that like I could be successful doing that. Some people, you know, have that, that innate skill to, to, to sort of get those things out there. Um, so that's why I decided to, to go with a more traditional publisher. Um, and I think that worked out well for me. Do you have another book in mind now that you've done one? Are you a little, you on your next, are you on your next project already? I've got like, I've got a bunch in my head right now. I was like, I found myself working on two, two ideas at once. And I was like, this is probably not a good idea. Like I need to pick, but I was like, but I love them both. Um, I can't tell you what they are right yet. No, of course so, not. They're, of still, course too, not. they're yeah. still too early in the process, but yeah, but yeah I have another but I, ha I have something else that I'm, I'm just kind of kicking off to start working on. Um, another book project or just a project? Another book project, yeah, that I'm, that I'm just, just sort of kicking off just now. Well, good for you. That's a yeah, good Yeah, thank you. Project. And then my thank other you. one in my head, I might actually need your help with, but um, we'll talk well, about that later. It's, yeah, it's, I, I got to push it aside to focus on the, the, the first well, one. That sounds, that sounds exciting. <laughs> so my last question before I let you go is, in the wine and spirits world in general, is there something that you're excited by? In addition to Gruno Veltliner in Pennsylvania? There you go, Eric said that. Yeah, I mean, no, I love that. I mean, that's great. Like I've never had a Gruner Veltliner from Pennsylvania. I've never thought about it, but now I will look for one. Do you have any producers to mention? Yeah, Galen, Galen Glenn um, okay. is there. It's actually the oldest um, Gruner planting east of the Rockies and the second oldest in the U.S. Okay. Um, and they, they just make great German style wines. Like their Rieslings are great. They've got a red blend called 
something German German bastards or something like that. <laughs> that's that's actually pretty good. Okay. All right. The grapes are hard to grow, but they taste delicious. Um, but yeah, so you can and and they they ship so and and they're reasonably priced too. All the wines are like between like fifteen and twenty five, and they're really okay. high quality. Okay, Galen Glenn. Yeah. Galen. I. And to sort of answer, to continue answering your other question, and I mean, I think you know this about my, you know, we we obviously met through more of Italian wine. Right, of course. Um, but uh, I just love the obscure. And I mean, uh, you know, obviously I, I, wrote about, I wrote about wine culture in the 1800s, so it's not, not going to come right. to be that shocking. But anything, anything new and different, um, I'm always kind of chasing those things down. Um, weird grapes. You know, grapes that have don't have a whole lot of grape. Have you found any new weird grapes that you're interested I in? Just, like I was trying to think of like, so I mean, one thing that one that I was drinking a fair amount through the the fall is Pace or the Mission grape, which is is like not oh, yeah. a new grape, but like it's right. so for anyone who doesn't know, it's like it was sort of the original California grape. It's actually right. comes from I think Spain. Spain, yeah. I think from Spain, maybe through Mexico. So were you drinking Chilean pais? Yeah, I've had um, mostly Chilean. I've had one or two from California. I actually found the Chilean ones to be better, at least in, yeah, in, in that Chilean small sample size. Really good. I mean, not that I've and They're had cheap, many. too. You know, yes. I, I found one, it was on sale in PA for like 10 bucks, eight, nine or 10 bucks. And it's right. not super complex, but like fresh, light, easy to drink. Right. Yeah, I'm so that's enjoying re it's uh, red wines, you know, that are that kind of fresh, light, easy to drink that you could even, I dare I say it, chill a little bit. Yeah. Like I, I kind of like those wines, you know, I, I do. I have to say, I'm really, really. Kind I've of had a hard time actually wine. transitioning because I was drinking the the, the mission or whatever, and mm -hmm. um. You know, I love like frappato and scava and you know, but any 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 sort of light red um, always with that with a lot of acidity and, and freshness always appeals to me. So, do you like Rossese from Liguria? I've only had it a few times, but yeah, so far I would say it's pretty good. I mean, the the one I've had most recently, I can't remember the producer off the top of my head, but it was it was Boulder, I thought. Okay, um, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. Have you? But then again, I mean, you know, what I consider bolder might be less bold to other people. You know, to Napa cab drinkers. <laughs> right. Every yeah, but I know what you mean. I know what. You mean. Have you ever had Gropello? Have you ever tried Gropello? Yeah, yeah. Those those are nice. Yeah, um, that's the kind of I love that sort of style, and they're perfect with Thanksgiving. Like those are perfect grapes yeah, for, sure. for the church, You know. Um, what are you drinking at Thanksgiving? Since we're right before Thanksgiving, what are you drinking? Do you know? Have you decided? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I, I may make make an audible, but, um, but yeah, maybe some Barbera. Um, I just got a, a Zweigelt in from from Austria, which I think is is in that same vein of like sort of lighter to medium bodied reds. So, so that's kind of the the thing I like to go with. I like reds. I mean, I had I was having this conversation the other day. Um, because we tend to smoke the turkey and we tend to do like a little heavier stuff. So I, I for, for me personally, the lighter, the, the whites don't tend to work. So do you fry the turkey in that like fryer thing? Is that what no, you I have, a, I have a smoker, so I'll, I'll put it in the smoker. You have a smoker. What else do you put in that smoker? Like, do you smoke? What else do you smoke? Do you smoke fish ever? Like, what if you smoked in terms of cooking? Anything and everything. So, so I recently, it's been a few years now, actually, but... Um, I recently got a pellet grill and so it's, um, it's, a, it's got an electrical component and, and you can just like punch in the, <laughs> the temperature you want it to be at. Yeah. Um, so you can do, you can, you can smoke it, you know, like a 225, like a traditional low and slow, or you can put it up to, all the way up to 500. I think it goes to. So, I mean, it doesn't do like, it's, it's still not really direct heat, but it's more of like a convection oven type. Got it. Um, okay. Thing, but so I do. I probably cook at a higher temperature more than I smoke, just because I'm using it right. kind of day to day, um, just to mm -hmm. do you know chicken, pork, you know, fish, right. whatever. Um, right. 
That's so interesting. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm not a big grill person. I have like a little, it's not a hibachi, but it's like more like that sort of you're style. You're a city person, so you're not, you know, well, I'm, in I'm, I'm in a suburbia, city. so. Not, not in the city. I mean, in New Jersey where I spent the pandemic. But anyway, it was so nice to talk to you. I own your book. I've read in your book. I haven't finished the whole book. Uh, there's there's a lot of information in there, but now uh, during this Thanksgiving weekend, while I'm drinking a nice chillable red, I'm going to go back to your book. It's a great there. cure for insomnia, I have to say. So oh, I have terrible insomnia, so I'll let you know <laughs> if that's a help. Anyway, it was super nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining you as well. Me. I appreciate you uh, having me. Thank you. Have so is there a website for where people can buy your book? Where can they buy it on Amazon? Yeah, thank you for thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, it's lostmountpen.com. I actually have it at the lowest price it's ever been right now. Just oh, okay. time for Black Friday. I don't know when this is launching, but when this, uh, okay. this podcast is going out. But Okay. Well, uh, if you, yes, maybe on Friday. So we'll see. Yeah. So in time for Black Friday, it's on Amazon. Lost it's on Amazon done. as well, but yeah, obviously if you buy it from me, it's a little better for me, but I don't really care. If you if it's you like ebooks, go on Amazon and get it on the Kindle. That's that's totally cool too. And so the website is lostpen.com. Lost Mount Pen. M O U N T spelled out. Yeah. Okay. Spelled out dot com. Perfect. Okay. And your but your handle is something totally different where you do your other writing. Life at the table? No, life, life at, at table. just life at table, no the <laughs> Okay, life at table. .com. Yeah, so that's on Twitter. Um, I didn't really, we didn't really get to talk about this, but you know, one of the reasons I um, wanted, to, one of the reasons I wanted to write a book or wanted to write a book for a while is that um, I, I've been trying, like, as a writer, and this is more of, like, again, the the process of like trying to trying to write things that are not as transient as as some 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 of the social media stuff is and and the blogs are it's like it just feels to me like sometimes we write things and people look at them for a couple of weeks and then they just go away and i was trying to figure out a way to to write some things that had a little more <laughs> staying power um and so book you know is one thing that came to mind also you know with the history angle it's like something that happened already. And so it's, you know, a hundred years from now, it's, we, you know, I guess we could know something more about it, but it's still potentially the same thing. So. Right. And it still happened uh, already. 100 yeah. Years so, after. so that, that was kind of, kind of my thinking. It, you just made me think of it when we were talking about life at table, because I, you know, I have a blog at life at table.com, but I, I just, I don't update it as, as much as I once did. Um, because I, again, I'm trying to really spend my time writing things that have a little, you know, a little more lasting power. And, you know, yeah, because yeah. I'm, because this isn't my day job, I'm able to sort of pick and choose what I want to spend my time on. And so that's, of course. Kind of what I'm... No, of course, but it is, it's also much less satisfying the sort of ephemeral nature of social media and the, the yeah. quick kind of snapshots of what people's attention span is and the size of, you know, the bite size information that people want it's as a as a writer it's not so satisfying yeah it can be frustrating for sure. that way. It's a little frustrating so that is a uh, great antidote to that is writing a long book about a historical topic so good for you i think that's yeah. that was that smart a smart and interesting thing about and your your neighborhood and i think it's great i wonder like I don't remember how old your son is at this point, but you know, I wonder if you're going to be asked to go to schools and talk about this book <laughs> at some point. You never know. Maybe you're going to like do a historic, like get dressed up in historical costumes and like. I mean, I feel, I feel like the alcohol aspect of it probably will preclude that from happening in certainly around here. Yeah. But um, but yeah. <laughs> but who knows? Dressing up. Is, yeah, there's there's a great character in the book with like a long beard. And he always wears a beret and. So yeah, I, I, we talked about me dressing up for him as Halloween. It, it didn't happen though. But it didn't happen. Well, yeah, there's you know, more Halloween's in the future, so you yeah. could always consider that in the future. Anyway, so Lost Mount Pen, very long title, but lostmountpen.com is where you can find the book. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to that conversation as much as I enjoyed speaking with Mike about his book on the Lost Mount Pen. I look forward to my conversation next week which will be with Hugh Price on his book about counting castles in Abruzzo. These are such fun conversations right before the holidays. 
um, all on wine books with people that I know in the industry. Thank you so much for taking your time to listen. You can find the Vanessa podcast on Friday, wherever you get your podcasts. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. This is Vignetto, a podcast. Friday.